Welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's new series of discussions with major theater artists of our times. For the first of a two-part chat, our guest today is the celebrated singer, well, that feels like an inadequate word in the case of our guest, the wildly gifted singer, <laughs> the great musician now at the peak of her artistry, the supreme interpreter of song, the muse for great composers. I have the honor of presenting Barbara Cook. Welcome to Lehman College. Thank you. I, uh, I believe you've uh, sung here before. Yes, I have several times, I believe. Uh, <coughs> and so you've been to Lehman College, and I know our paths have crossed uh, twice in our careers. Uh, uh, we worked on that wonderful Meredith Wilson piece for uh, oh, for yeah. Juilliard, where I, I really got to know you just a little bit, yeah. and you and Wally. And uh, I enjoyed doing that a lot. I did too. And uh, uh, John Coriano, who teaches here, uh, and I wrote uh, Jack and Jill for you, and yes. uh, that was some time ago. Uh, I've spent the last uh, uh, two days completely immersed in your work, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm channeling you at this moment. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say, it it uh, it just it just blows me away. And uh, I uh, I should mention by way of introduction that uh, uh, that just a few of your honors. You you uh, I I have to read them because there's so many actually. That you're uh, uh, a member of the Broadway Hall of Fame. You've won Tony. Grammy and Drama Desk Awards, um, and uh, there must be countless other awards and, 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 and citations that you've gotten. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a living landmark. <laughs> <laughs> I am. There is such a thing. Uh, your, your I thought that was good. I like that one. <laughs> I like the living part particularly. <laughs> <laughs> your career started in the, in the heyday the golden age uh, of Broadway in in the 50s and 60s, yeah. and uh, and you're still singing uh, in concert stage and cabaret all over the world. Um, uh, this is a, a most remarkable career. Uh, where were you born? Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, long time ago. Uh, did you uh, did you how did you get into singing? How, how what what possessed you? Well, I did. I never got into singing. I I breathed and I sang. I don't remember not singing. I always sang. Um, did you study it, or did you? Well, I studied with a few people in Atlanta. I sang for my barber once. He used to give me the little Dutch haircuts that I hated. My mother insisted mm -hmm. on those. And he was quite impressed. I must have been, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, something like that. And uh, one of the people he knew, uh, she never told me who she was. She, she supplied me with, with car fare and vocal lessons and whatever money I needed for, uh, for music, because I, I was really quite poor when I was a kid. And I never found out who she was. So I, I did take some classes. Um, in in Atlanta, but they did. I don't think they helped particularly, but they didn't hurt. Um, I was probably too young to study, but then when I came to New York, I, I certainly I, you know, I connected with a very very important teacher for me. Oh, who was that? His name was Bob Coben. Uh huh. He's been dead for a long time. Uh, died quite young. He was only 48. I studied with him for about 10 years. What possessed you to come to New York? How did you get to New York? Well, I certainly had, uh, I first came to New York when I was what? I don't know. I'm, I was born in 27. I came here in 39. So I was 12, I guess, for the World's Fair with a school group. Oh. And uh, I had loved New York even before then. I think because of the movies, you uh -huh. know, what I, what I thought about New York, what I thought was New York. Um, I came on a vacation with my mother and uh, a friend of hers to visit the friend's brother, whose kids were away at school, so we could all stay at his apartment up near Columbia University. And uh, I had decided, 
before I left Atlanta that I was not going to come home right away anyway. I was going to see what I could do. Plus which, I was madly in love with Herb Schreiner, <laughs> whom I had met in Atlanta, who was doing a show called Inside USA. So that was, that was the final thing, that i got to be near him. So I, I don't know, I think I would have had the courage anyway to stay, but that was, had to be near him. And you, you came to New York, and uh, how did you get involved? How did you become uh, Broadway's favorite ingenue? Well, you know, at the time it seemed a long time, but actually it was only three years before I did my first Broadway show, and I had... Um, how did that happen? Basically, the leading role, the, the ingenue and, um, and juvenile roles in that particular show, which was Flahuli, were the main uh, characters. They carried the story, do you know? No. Uh, how did it happen? I don't know. Um, I found somebody to study with who wasn't terribly good. But uh, again, you know, she didn't hurt, and uh, you know, you meet people, you audition for this, you find out about that, you get the, those papers that kids mm -hmm. get, you know, where the auditions are being held, all that kind of thing, and keep your ears open, and that's how it happened. Uh, in short order, um, you went into, after Flahuli, what did you do? You, uh, Not much. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought I had it made. No, let's see, Flahuli was 1951. And um, the next thing I did on Broadway was 54, I think. No, that's not true. I don't know. Hell, I don't know all this stuff. Okay. Uh, I, I know I you did. were in, I was in 1954. City, I was at City Center with uh, Oklahoma. That was like the 12th year or something of their touring shows. I'd, I toured for a year in that with Florence Henderson, and uh, she played uh, uh, Laurie, and I played um, Ada Annie. Somehow you, create, you went into Plain and Fancy where you created the role of Hilda Miller. Mm -hmm. Now that's quite a, a, a jump. Um, and then you uh, went into Kunigunda and Leonard Bernstein. There's the jump. That's the big jump. Yeah, Plain and Fancy was mm. not that big a jump. jump. But mm, Candide was a big jump. Uh, yeah. for our I thought I had really finally stepped in it, if you know what I mean. For people who, for uh, our audience who doesn't know uh, who don't know Candide. Candide is, is the legendary show by uh, Leonard Bernstein with lyrics by Stephen Sondheim, among no, others. No, 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 not, in the, no, not originally. Not originally. Stephen uh, added uh, uh, lyrics to um, the revival that Hal Prince did, that first okay. one. I think it was the first right. revival, first one I was aware of. But originally he did not uh, have any of those lyrics. That was Lillian Hellman mm -hmm. and John Latouche. And, um, and Richard Wilbur. And, and Bernstein himself no. and Richard Wilbur, yes. It is a fiendishly difficult show, especially the role of Kunigunda. Well, it's, it's uh, as it was written in that particular production, it is extraordinary just in, uh, in, in the, um, the kind of stamina, vocal stamina it took to do it. I actually, because I'd never sung uh, over a G on the that staff before, you know, I don't know music that well, but I certainly know when it starts going up over the staff, you know, <laughs> and I counted all the high notes one night, because I'd never done all that. Uh, for that particular role in that production, there were four E-flats over high C, and there were six D-flats, 16 B-flats, and <laughs> 21 high Cs. Isn't that extraordinary? It isn't. I did that for eight times a week. I don't know. I did it. It's like the bumblebee. You know, he doesn't know he can't fly. So he I, I had no idea I wasn't supposed to be able to do that because, you know, in, in uh, Broadway, you just you do eight times a week. Whatever they give you, you do it. So I thought I could do it. I did it, actually. No, the, the other uh, members of the cast were opera singers. Is that correct? Or, or yes, a number with of the them exception were. of some of the character roles. And, and Max Adrian, who did Pangloss, was an right. actor who sang quite well. So there you were doing this. It's, it must be one of the great coloratura roles in, uh, of music. Um, well, um, 
Of course, it's being done by opera companies all the time now. And uh, Renee Fleming is a friend. She told me that she thinks it's so difficult that she would not do it except occasionally. She wouldn't, she wouldn't do it on stage. She, she, she um, recorded it. But, uh, and you did this week after week. <laughs> Yes. But now, look, Renee does things <laughs> I wouldn't think about touching then or now or ever. Uh, but for some reason, it's because of the tessitura, I think. It's, it just stays up there. Yeah. Did you know what you were getting into, and uh, um, or you just... Well, yeah, I did, mm -hmm. sure. I was scared to death. I, I've listened to that, uh, that album, and I've read the, uh, uh, the book by Lillian Hellman, mm -hmm. and... I, I've asked any, everyone attached who's ever worked on who worked on that production, why wasn't that the? When I read it and when I listen to it, I say this should have been should have uh, been playing for years. What what was the difficulty with that? Well, you have to remember that I never saw the show. Right. So when 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 you're embroiled in something, when you're on this side of it. Right. I have no way of knowing the real impact for the audience for the, of the show as a whole because I'm busy doing what I'm doing, do you know? Uh, at the time, though, the general feeling was that the book didn't work for some reason or other. I, as you know, the yes. Voltaire is very episodic, and I think it's difficult to do those, sh those uh, stories that are episodic in that right. way. So I don't know why it didn't work. Certainly the score has always been uh, highly valued, always. In fact, uh, opening night, the overture stopped the show. Uh, well, by stopping the show, I mean there was so much applause, they didn't repeat it, but it really went on for quite a long time. Unusual, very unusual. In fact, I've never heard of that happening. It's, it, it, whenever I listen to the album uh, with you on it, I, I um uh, it just never fails to amaze me. It's one of my favorite scores, and um, I, I find it uh, an inspiration. It's never been unavailable, that recording, which is, again, that was 1956, right. so it's almost 50 years that that has always been available, and that certainly is not true with, with uh, all shows that I've done, by uh -huh. any means. From that role, you went into Marion the Librarian in The Music Man. Now... Uh, I, um, I I find that show just unspeakably beautiful too. <laughs> uh, I, I it's one of my favorite. Beautiful. That's interesting. You yeah. call it beautiful. I think it's just beautiful. It sure does work. Uh, I think it's beautiful too. Uh, that's my opinion. I'm just about to steal the opening for my new show myself. <laughs> uh, I'm inspired by something that Meredith Wilson did there. I see. And uh, I, f I find it's a gold mine for, for a writer. And uh, wh how did you get involved with the show? What, uh, what was the process? Well, um, if I remember correctly, uh, I was asked if I wanted to hear the score. I went to uh, Herb Green's apartment, if I remember correctly. Herbert was the um, conductor, and I heard the score. And of course, when I heard that, that zingspiel kind of thing that that uh, Meredith did, I I don't think anybody's ever heard anything like it. And till there was you, was be I I thought it was just beautiful. And um, then let's see, Frank Lesser was one of the producers, and I think I think he somebody insisted that I sing for them on stage, which I did, and uh, for some reason. Uh, toward the end of the audition, Frank Lesser said, how high can you sing? And I went, well, oh, <laughs> who knows what the hell I hit. But he was impressed, and uh, yeah. I don't know why he thought I had to sing that high for that score. But a um, um, lot of people were being thought of for Bob's role, for Bob Preston's role. Right. A lot of people. Andy Griffith was there that day when I first heard the score. And... Um, Oh gosh, I can't think of his name. My brain, my brain's not doing the name. Um, in the Wizard of Oz, uh, the the um, scarecrow is Ray Bolger. Ray, Ray, Bolger. Ray Bolger wanted to do that role very badly. That would have been interesting. Yeah, it, it would not have been as good. No. You know, I think that role has never been cast as well as it should. Maybe I'm prejudiced, certainly, because of Robert. Mm. But what he had was. 
enormous sexual power on stage. And I think if you don't have that, that doesn't make sense because he seduced that entire town. You know, every everybody <laughs> was in love with him. And if I think the show doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense if that's not true. And I haven't seen anybody He's the Pied playing Piper. that role since then who has that kind of sexual power on Pied stage. Pied Piper and yeah. uh, uh, the you go uh, anywhere with him, you know. I, I find that the uh, combination of, of the lyrics. I'm sorry. The com <laughs> <laughs> not me, however. Uh, I found the combination, uh, listening to it today, the combination of your lyricism and the almost bordering on rap like quality of some of the other stuff, they're constantly counterposing the uh, uh, rhythmical stuff against. The most beautiful lyrical stuff yeah. is is uh, is unique. I've never heard anything. You know, I like don't, that. I don't know if Meredith was the first person to come up with that kind of thing, but do you remember a show, Tallulah Bankhead, a radio show, Tallulah Bankhead? It was the last big radio show. Mm -hmm. I think they call it the Big Show. I think. Right. And uh, I remember listening to that, uh, and Meredith was the musical director, and when it came time for the. Um, uh, advertisements, the commercials, he had a chorus sing, sing speaking, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly how he did, but it was all in rhythmic speech. And I, wa I don't know if he came up with that idea for, for the radio commercials, and then these pieces uh, in Music Man obviously must have come out of that. Right. Uh, but, he, you know, instead of just somebody just reading by camel cigarettes or something, he uh, he had it all in rhythmic speech, which was fascinating. Even uh, then, he, then. Um, uh, it seems, it sounds like it influenced My Fair Lady. There's an element of that in My Fair Lady. Oh, uh, perhaps, perhaps. Or they, or they were thinking along some kind of synergy. They happened at the same time, though, didn't they? Yeah, they. Didn't I don't they? know which preceded which, but I they. I don't remember which was. First. But there, there's that rhythmic speech in My Fair Lady as well. I think Fair Lady was a little before Music Man. I think so. Wow. Well, Not sure. Anyway, uh, you uh, uh, you played in that show, and then you did role after role, yeah. ingenue roles. You became the. Well, do you know they really weren't ingenue roles? I, I've been stuck with that my entire career. I guess it's because of the way I looked. You know, uh -huh. I just sort of. <laughs> fresh face, uh, but when you think about it, in the production that we did, Kunaganda in Candide is not really an Ajnu role. She's she's a cartoon of an Ajnu, and at the end, she is an old crone with a hump on her back, right. and she goes into the stream and comes out the young girl again. You know that was in the, uh, that was uh, Tron Guthrie's right. idea. I think that ending. Uh, and then in Music Man, that's certainly not a national no. role. She's uh, her mother's face. She's never going to get married. She's practically a spinster. She's you know, the town librarian who has no boyfriend. Uh, so that's hardly an. These are character role. roles, really. Yeah, but I don't know. Character roles with they blonde keep hair. They keep telling me I'm an ingenue. <laughs> they don't say it so much lately, but. <laughs> in 1974, uh, you began to work with. Uh, with Wally, Wally Harper. Mm -hmm. How did uh, your um, uh, your accompanist, your um, uh, composer? He he was a dance uh, a dance arranger, a conductor for you. W where did you meet Wally, and how did that uh, um, happen? Well, I don't remember the first time I met Wally. Um, my voice teacher became a kind of surrogate father to him when he came to New York, and they had come together because he had done stock with my teacher's wife, and he loved my work and mentioned, she said, oh, well, my, my husband teaches her and so forth. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, they became so close. Uh, I don't remember meeting him then. I think it was after She Loves Me one night. Uh, and I met him several times in between and didn't remember. Then in 1973, with uh, with several other people, I did um, concerts all around the country, um, celebrating the 75th birthday of George Gershwin, and uh, he came to see that show several times. 
the man who um, who was the um, advance man for for this Gershwin show. I hadn't sung in New York for about five years. I'd done a play, but I hadn't sung, and he thought it was time for me to sing. So he was going to produce um, a concert, and a friend said, you know, you, ought, you and Wally ought to get together. These friends who really got mm -hmm. us together. And uh, we, got to, we got together to do this concert that this man had uh, an idea about. But he found it more difficult, because he'd never done this before, mm -hmm. to earn, to, rather to, to get the money for it. And by that time, a little club on 46th Street called Brothers and Sisters, they had heard that we had some material together and asked us to come in. And uh, we were a big hit there. So we stayed, I can't remember how long, maybe six weeks or something. And actually, it's pretty amazing. We did one night at the Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut. And then we did this run in, at Brothers and Sisters. And then in, I think, November of that year, 74, uh, we played two weeks in a, some sort of club with Mad Men ran the club in uh, Philadelphia. And the next stop was Carnegie Hall in January of 75. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. We were scared uh, to death. Can you imagine? Well, I'd sung at Carnegie before, but I'd never, I'd never done a big concert like that. And I'd never, I'd never sung at Carnegie when I was it, if you know what I mean. Um, it what that was an extraordinary event. Now, I mm -hmm. I got that album at uh, Tower Record the other day, and they told me that uh, that's a very big seller of theirs. Oh, that's nice. Uh, it was re-released a few years ago. Uh, now this is uh, another phenomenon that uh, uh, this was recorded in '75, and yes, that's really unheard of these days. Uh, what do you mean? That a record would continue to sell oh, so yes. long and it's an ex it's as well, fresh that, as the day know, it was made. That seems to be the the case with the recordings that I've made. Uh, I'm not Shania Twain, so that suddenly, you know, in two minutes it sells 100,000 copies. But they sell continually. So it seems to work out in the, in the long run. Which actually, it's better for me, you know, because um, a lot of the pop records they they are not available after a while unless they're enormous sellers right you know. but my stuff is generally with the exception of um, something I did for MCA records um, the Disney album that one right you can get it on eBay sometimes <laughs> but uh, but it's not uh, available in stores I understand uh, now you've been working with Wally ever since now this is a remarkable uh, uh, longevity this uh, collaboration has mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I've worked with Wally just at one time and uh, and you if this is uh, uh, I could sense the uh, like you uh, you have a secret language almost uh, <laughs> the two of you it's well do you know it's amazing that that first day when I walked into his apartment to work with him you know uh, we started up here on we started there instead of starting there you know, we didn't have to go through some of those early steps. It's just we spoke each other's musical language immediately. We were both coming from the mm -hmm. same kind of theatrical, dramatic place. And his idea was what he thought, wouldn't it be interesting? I tell you, he has, when he plays piano, it's a kind of rock-solid bass that he gives you. Right. Unlike some pianists who sort of, you know, sway away from from this solid thing, and his feeling was that it might be very interesting to put my lyrical kind of over the bar singing uh, over that kind of solid, solid bass. So that I think was one of the things that intrigued him in the beginning. Barbara, I'm getting the high sign to wrap up this first part. Already, my it's goodness! It's just the time has uh, uh, just gone by, and uh, but we will talk soon again okay. and uh, it's been a great uh, pleasure to reconnect with you and Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. look forward to our next conversation okay uh, uh, and we'll cap capture the rest of your wonderful career sounds excellent thank you Barbara Cook and to our studio and our home audience thank you